Uh, welcome everyone to the Wednesday, October 16th, 2024 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Um, tonight we are focused, most focusing most of our meeting on hearing for, from four of the different applicants. Uh, the JFK Tennis and Basketball Court Rehabilitation Project, the Mainsfield Flood Resilience Plan, the Community Gardens Pavilion, presented by Grow Food Northampton, and the mortgage, mortgage subsidy proposal from Valley CDC. These four will be in that order. Before we get to that, though, we begin every meeting with general public comment. Is there anybody out there who wishes to speak about anything having to do with the Community Preservation Act or committee, uh, but not specifically to these four proposals? Anyone out there? Um, Brian, I, I wanted to speak to it, but I was going to say something about the four proposals just during public comment, and then I won't be voting. I won't, I won't have any other discussion about it. Okay, sure, please. Um, I wanted you to know that the Transportation and Parking Commission has been considering culverts all along uh, the Mill River that they're, they're washing out the road. And so I think there's more going on in that river corridor and getting some information from Donna Lascalia about what she's been studying along those roads would be important to think about the Mains Field project. And my other comment very shortly is um, I went to the basketball courts and um, I'm sorry, the tennis courts, and they look pretty good from a distance. But if you really get down and look at them, they're in pretty bad shape. But I did want to just raise the issue of would there be any consideration of doing uh, a pickleball version at the end or putting in a good stable pickleball nets that could be used so it would give those uh, surfaces more activity. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other general public comments, folks out there? Sarah, can you see anybody? Uh, no raised hands. No raised hands. So moving right along, uh, Sarah sent us uh, um, later this afternoon minutes from our April 3rd meeting. That was the public comment um session for the spring round of proposals a lot of folks commenting on the accessible playground uh project um so april 3rd meeting uh, uh is there a motion for approval of minutes moved thank you julia second second uh thank you uh, any discussion on the minutes? No? Uh, Sarah, you need to take us through a roll call vote yes. on this. Is that correct? Roll call vote on those. Jeff? Yes. Uh, Chris Hellman? Yes. Chris Tate? Yes. Martha? Yes. Julia? Yes. Uh, Chris? I think you got us both already. Uh, oh, yeah, that's why my number is off. I'm sorry. There's only two Chris's, not three. Huh. Uh, uh, Kevin? Yes. And Brian? Uh, yes. Okay. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, chair's report. Uh, there is none, so we will move right through that. So we'll begin with, again, our main agenda item. We will be looking at uh, Community Preservation Coalition dues request and approval of the plan after these four proposals. Um, we have eight proposals in front of us for this fall session. Uh, $1.377 million in requests. Our projected funds available is somewhere a little over $1.9 million. So while $1.377 million come in requests, that's for this round, we have 1.944 million thereabouts available for both rounds. So it's important for applicants to know that. Applicants, we've had a chance to read your proposals. Uh, 
We've also had a chance to ask written questions and some of those answers were sent back to us. Sarah presented that, that with us this afternoon. Uh, in the interest of time, we're gonna ask that you keep your, your comments uh, or the, your presentations to about 20 minutes. That includes questions and answers from us. So if you could be respectful of that time, that, that, that would be nice. We tend not to cut you off, but just, just be aware of that. Another important thing for applicants to know is that on November 6th, that is the first Wednesday meeting of the CPC in November, we will be asking for public comments on these proposals. So if you have folks that um, you would like to bring to the meeting to speak about your proposals, that is the time to do it. That is November 6th on Zoom at seven o'clock. So rally your constituents and bring them to that meeting. However bleary-eyed, exhausted, emotionally spent they may be, rumor has it there's something going on November 5th having to do with United States politics, or so they say. Um, so encouraging everyone, of course, to vote on November 5th and then come to the meeting on November 6th to, to talk about the proposals. Um, so without further ado, we're going to begin with the Northampton Recreation folks and the JFK Tennis and Basketball Court Rehabilitation Project. Anne Marie, I believe you are doing that. Is that correct? Yes. Um, do you need a screen share? Have Sarah do stuff? Actually, let me uh, let me try Sarah on my end. See if I can do this. Um, also with me is Tony. Um, I get his last name. Tony, how do you say your last name again? Kuzniers. Kuzniers. He's a supervisor yeah. of school maintenance. So Tony is also presenting with me. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tony. I'm going to keep Thank my video you. off. It's a little more stable that way for me. So. Okay, so I'm going to try to share my screen. Let's see. Is that working? Yeah, okay. Great. Um, let's see. So, all right, so we have the, I think I can see it on here. Hold on one second. Sorry, my screen is not showing me what I want it to show me. All right, so um, the rehabilitation and improvements at the tennis and basketball courts at JFK Middle School. So for those of you who haven't seen where they are, they are behind the school. Um, you can see here where Bridge Road is and the parking lot. And in the back is the um, basketball courts and the six tennis courts. Tony, feel free to jump in whenever you want to. I will, thank you. Okay, so the um, just for a little history of it, these were built with the new renovation. We keep calling it new renovation, but it was actually in 1996, which was almost 30 years ago, which is crazy to think. Um, so the courts were built then when the pool was added on to the JFK Middle School um, and there was a prop two and a half override to fund the addition to the middle school. So the courts and the and the basketball court were added. In 2016, there was um, extensive crack repairs done by the school department um, that cost about $40,000. And then each year, Tony works with his crew to perform an annual crack repair to the best of their ability. Um, you can see some of the pictures there that show how large the cracks have become. Yeah, and yeah. I can speak to a little bit about the repair that we did, you know, 2016, the life of that was five to seven years for the repair. Uh, it's an asphalt-based surface. So the cracks that were repaired lasted the time frame that they recommended. The cracks have just kept growing, as you can see in the pictures. And if you've been out there, I think as was stated, from a distance, it, it looks good. Um, but when you get up there, it, it's certainly bad. Uh, the cracks have grown year after year. Water and freeze cycles um, have widened them. Uh, the bases of all of the fence, the concrete poles for the nets are also heaved and, and coming apart. 
So that's it's past the point that we can keep repairing it. The varsity tennis team uses these courts as well. Um, they have concerns that they're going to not be able to use them this spring for tennis. Um, just they can't risk injury. And then the playability of the courts is poor. There's dead areas underneath the surface. So the ball just doesn't bounce well or true. Um, you can see those pictures there. We we crack repair every spring. It only lasts a season and then kind of breaks apart by the end of the season. So we've been doing it every year ourselves. So in terms of who plays on them, Tony mentioned the high school Hamp High tennis teams. Um, the Park and Rec, we have programs throughout the year starting as soon as as soon as the nets can go up, as soon as the um, frost is done and the snow is gone, the nets go up. There's people out there all the time. We had this past year over 350 uh, kids in, in lessons, uh, over 250 adults took part in lessons, and also there was an adult league play. In terms of JFK, their physical education department uses it, obviously. They play all sorts of games out there, including tennis, pickleball, and speed minton. They are on, um, the, t the girls and boys tennis teams are on there also, and there's always people in the community out there playing whenever they can. They're actually still getting kicked off during the day here when school's going on session because they're not supposed to be out there, but there's people out there whenever they can play, and this weather has been amazing for it um, in the certain corners where they can sneak in without too big of the cracks that are out there. Um, on the basketball courts, there's uh, various games that are played out there. There's about 500 JFK students. The phys ed teachers use it for different kinds of games, intro introducing, to, uh, introducing them to bicycling, mountain biking, some of their adaptive PE. Uh, the community members obviously are out there using pickup for pickup basketball when they can. And our summer camps, one of them are actually our um, teenage summer camp is based here at JFK in the summer, in the mornings. They start here, um, use the courts also for games and different activities. Anne Marie, the, the previous yes. slide mentioned speed minton. What is speed minton? Yeah. That's a PE a PE class. I think it's like badminton really fast. Okay. <laughs> that was straight from the PE teacher. <laughs> um, so this is the probable cost that we have gotten from Berkshire Design for the entire um, rehab and improvements to the courts. Um, Tony can tell a little bit about they um, did a preliminary um, assessment of them. And... Yeah, I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Yep. And, and the reason that we're, we're asking for the money to do tennis and basketball, they were built at the same time and built on a single asphalt surface, basically, that continues through. Um, we could realize some significant cost savings if we are able to do both at the same time as well. Um, if we're to separate the projects out, um, the costs go up significantly. Um, I think one of the questions that came to us was about the subsurface. So Berkshire Design did have a, a firm do core sampling uh, through several of the different areas on the basketball court and the tennis court to get an idea of what the surface layers were like. Um, and from their viewpoint, um, it's satisfactory. Uh, they think that the base is good. It just needs a little more material and obviously leveling and then some regrading, but subsurface, everything looks really good. Um, that was gonna add to the cost significantly. If we had to excavate the entire area and then rebuild it all the way from base level. Um, they don't think that we have to. Okay. So the timeline, as Tony mentioned, um, the, the preliminary study has been conducted by Berkshire Design, site evaluations, opinion of probable costs that we've just seen. If funding was secured, so um, there has already been $600,000, correct, Tony? 600 in capital correct. improvements from the city. Yeah secured um, and if this was funded with CPA, the project could go out to bid right in January, which is a great time to go out for for um, hopefully some good cost prices on it. And then best case scenario would be to wait until school gets out 
and start the project in June. That would obviously, um, you know, to affect the parks and rec programs and things, but it would also be a lot easier to get the um, construction company in here and out of here each day without any of the students around, without any of the traffic of the school around and all those kinds of things. So um, yeah. the plan would be to go then. Talk a little bit about the capital process. Um, like Amory said, we've we're approved for six hundred thousand. I've been asking uh, for probably five years uh, for that money. Uh, I was just approved this past year based on some cost estimation that we had done in the past. So obviously our evaluation now was way off when they when they did the and that estimates now with inflation and cost of materials um specifically the fencing and the asphalt um that went quite a bit over that 600,000 that we had requested um timeline for the work yeah would be right when school's done probably mobilizing before then but having it pretty much done during the summer um, when school comes back in. I think that it should be about wrapped up um, with minor work remaining. And you should have some, um, there were some public support letters that went in, some emails that Sarah received. I'm not sure everyone got them yet, but um, those have been received from various people, PE teachers, the um, Camp High Athletic Director, is in your packet there also. Some of the people who play just play on the courts and also some of the members of the USTA, which is the United States Tennis Association who help run and support tennis throughout the world and New England um, with how important this would be to everybody. Um, I, uh, speaking about the pickleball um, sort of question on, there is pickleball that is played out there now. There are not plans for lines to be actual lines to be put down on the courts because the high school teams use all the courts when they are playing. They have not typically wanted to have extra lines down. It, it gets confusing and hard for them. People do bring their own nets now sometimes um, even, and they play on half of the courts. So it would be in addition to the six courts that are starting construction in within the next couple weeks up at Ellerbrook Field, the six courts will be started. Um, this would be an additional area that people could still do some overflow play if they wanted to. That's all of our presentation on our end. Does anybody have any questions or anything for us? Thank you, Anne-Marie and Tony. Uh, questions for Anne-Marie or Tony? Anyone out there with questions? Martha. Yeah, so I was the person that asked about the subsurface conditions. Um, and then something related to that too, just about eligibility. Um, you know, I realize, yeah, this is pavement and has a limited life. Um, is it your assessment that, or I should say the engineer's assessment that these cracks are being caused by uh, freeze and thaw? Um, just wear and tear, what, what, are, what is causing them? All of those above. Um, yeah, okay. it's pavement. So the the basically the tennis court surface had failed over time. It wears through the water and the asphalt underneath is cracking. And then, yeah, freeze and thaw cycles. And then just had worn away and broken apart the asphalt. Okay, so so that that would be my concern is just that um, there's sufficient investigation of what's going on underneath that. You mentioned um, dead areas under the pavement in the tennis area. Um, are, are, do you mean voids? Like what what are you talking about? Now that would it's like the it's hard to explain. You have to be out there really. The it's a separation probably of the tennis court surface and then the asphalt underneath it. They're not adhered to each other anymore. So okay. it, yeah, it creates a, a weird consistency of surface. So if a tennis ball hits it, it doesn't bounce the same. Okay. So, you know, just one thing that um, I would just put this out there again to the engineers that, you know, that 
it's possible the hydrology in this area has changed over time because that happens a lot in, anyway. And, um, you know, you may, may be getting more water accumulation under those quartz as it is. And I would just be, um, you know, careful that there's enough of a good drainage layer underneath them all so that you don't have this cracking problem because that would, that would not be a good, you know, investment of city funds if that um, is an underlying problem. So that would be mm -hmm. my only caution. I think that then, we all agree. And I think the engineers agreed to, um, to why they- And there's no, okay. And they them. haven't identified a need for some kind of like under drains or anything like that. No, no, not after okay. reviewing the core sampling data. Okay. Um, and then I, I guess the other question maybe is an eligibility one is whether this is considered maintenance funding and whether that we can consider that. I mean, that's probably more a question for Sarah than it is for the applicant. Sarah, let me just pull up the eligibility chart. So, um, like the the annual crack sealing and um, annual work that um, Anne Marie and Tony mentioned is done every year. That would clearly be maintenance. It would not be eligible for CPA funding, uh, but significant uh, work that contributes to the you know the overall value of a property would be considered um, rehabilitation, which which would okay. Be. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Chris Hellman. Hi. Uh, thanks, Amory and uh, Tony. Uh, since you were the one who mentioned, it, I'm going to direct it at you. Um, you talked about um, the cost projections and um, being somewhat dated, and that there were that the the six hundred thousand originally projected was 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 no longer a solid figure. Um, is the 400 that's being requested from CPC funds being used towards making up that difference or is the million dollar total price tag that we're seeing here not reflecting um, any changes in cost based on um, out, outdated projections? Did I say that right? Did I? Um, I think I can get the point. Um, yeah. Yeah, the the million dollar, a little over million dollar total it would give us enough money to redo the whole thing with current cost estimation. If that makes if that answers your question. So it was projected out a couple of years ago at, at six hundred thousand. I think for just the tennis courts this year it was a little over eight hundred when Berkshire Design just did a cost estimation for us. They based some of that off the real world bid numbers they got on the pickleball courts for Amory. So it's a pretty accurate number. Yeah. So so that 600 plus the 400 and change gives us enough money to do both basketball and tennis fully. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Other questions for Tony or Amory? We are good to go on these two. Nobody else? Julia, was that a hand or is that just a pitching? No. You want to speak to this as a recreation person? No questions? I, I, I have no questions now. Okay, thanks. Uh, when we, oh, yeah. Um, so again, uh, Emory and Tony, remember the first Wednesday evening in November is when chance for your supporters to come out and present their cases to us as a committee. So we'll look forward to that. Great. All Thank right. you all. Thank you. And I think you're still on. I am staying. Thank you, Tony. Right. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. It was nice to meet everybody. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Okay. Have a good night. Thanks. So next up is the Mainsfield Flood Resilience Plan, also featuring Anne-Marie. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Okay, let's see. Let's see if we can get this up here again. Let's see, screen one. Okay, can you see that? All right. My screen, there we go. All right. Okay, so this is a really exciting project for us. Um, Mains Field, which has flooded significantly in the past year. Um, it had flooded in the past with um, 
different different hurricanes and things, but this past year it was some just major high waters that came through. So we decided that we really wanted to try to do something to um to stop this and help it and maybe find a way to mitigate it. So just a little bit of the history of, of Maine's field. Um, in 1922, Julius P. Maines gifted it to the city. And since then, it's been, um, you know, full of different recreation activities. Now it has it only, the city's only lighted softball field for sand volleyball courts, a pavilion that is busting with activities every weekend and it has restrooms, which are a little bit outdated, but they're there. Um, a, Petanque Court, which I can never say correctly, um, and different green spaces where there's yoga classes, people always walking dogs, taking walks out there, just hanging out. People are having lunch down there on the picnic tables all the time. So it's a very busy place. This is um, where it's located on Riverside Drive. You can see overhead where the softball field is and play area. The two sand volleyball courts are here. This green space is used for all different kinds of activities. It's a little bit of a hill, but people still are playing on it. There's a little play, a little bit, couple play structures, um, the pavilion and the Pentaki courts back here, and then another green space. And you can see the Mill River, how the Mill River, which is not our friend when it decides to not take its turn here and it decides to come right through. Um, so the Mill River is right along there. These are just some of the amenities close up that we have at the field. The Lions Club, Lions Club, Northampton Lions Club Pavilion that I mentioned, where there are different kinds of parties and celebrations. The softball field, which has hundreds of games each year for different leagues. Um, and the four sand volleyball courts are super popular. There are the courts that were funded in part with the ARPA funds within the past two years. Um, it's a kind of a bocce game, except for um, you don't roll, you throw the ball more. Um, and then there's green space that I mentioned throughout the field that you can kind of see in that picture in the background. So here's some of the flooding events that have happened. Um, in 2023, we had two, July and December, which was um, very frustrating and something new. Um, and we had to close and it was closed for over a year before the proper repairs could take place. Um, obviously flooding has become more pre prevalent and um, this project would help mitigate any future, hopefully help mitigate any future damage and sus sustain the park. You can see some of the pictures there at the softball field. This is where the water has been coming in um, over the years with a couple of hurricanes and then with the flooding events we've had, you know, the edges of the edge of the river has been compromised, obviously. Um, and the water is coming in easier and easier when it gets higher. So these were the ones last year that took place, came right down the road. This was a picture of the road after um, the floods came through. So this just tells you a little bit. I won't read the whole thing. This was in the in the um, the study and what it's in what it's projected to do using um, at looking at the Mill River from approximately Bliss Street down to Clement Street. Clem, yeah, Clement says Clemens Clement Street to look at the um, the modeling of it, um, establish the conditions of the river and come up with some kind of um, demonstrate the, the greatest impacts, what the strategies would be to minimize the flooding and um, examine future conditions based on climate and, and participation projections. Excuse me. So part of this would include um, really great community engagement and a vision, visioning workshop, a three-day workshop or so um, that will take in all sorts of people's ideas and focus groups and engage people to see what people want down there, um, what kinds of activities are taking place, what do they want to see continue to take place down there um, in the future. So we have um, been engaged with um, Fuss and O'Neill for this plan and for talking about what you know, this could possibly look like. They have worked on plans such as this in different areas. This is just pictures of one in Andover, I believe it was. Um, kind of shows you this, this is kind of, this has the same kind of thing with the river along the side of it. Um, and then what they would do would, would be to project a 50 year flood, a, you know, a 10 year flood, a hundred year flood, what it would look like. And then 
come up with um, amenities and site improvements that would be able to um, recover from those if they happen and also um, work with them in different ways. So it doesn't, you know, close the park for a year. Um, these are some of their other ones that they did in um, Veterans Park in Munson. They've been working up in Munson with plans with that town with a state grant. Um, after they did this plan, they, are, they have some state grant money to um, start on uh, working on a couple of them. So it sort of shows you, this one shows you like here they have some tennis courts in different playing areas, the water, they have a, a, a river, I can't remember what it's called right there, that comes by these parks and it kind of, and they take a look at what will happen if the water comes in, what will it hit, what kind of amenities and things, and how can we improve the areas that are currently at the park and come up with ways that will mitigate the flooding. Um, this is a, these are some of the potential ideas they've used in other places. You can see this is like the edge, this is the edge of a river, some of the things they've done. Um, obviously there's different kinds of plantings and bushes and trees and um, waterways and things that you can work with to help direct the water in other ways and help it, you know, go to maybe to a different part of the park where it's can um, recover from it faster. Um, so these are just some of the things that it would, the project would do, the study would do. Um, these are just a couple, you should have again, some of the letters, emails from some of the users. There are There is a huge contingent of um, volleyball players down there that have been playing. Um, this one down here, Mark Carmian's email, be sure you read through that because it is so heartwarming about all the different um, the, um, effects that it has had on friendships and exercise. And even they all go out after, they all are down there. Um, so really shows you some of the special um, things that, that recreation brings to our, to this area, especially the neighbors. There's an uh, email from one of the neighbors who has loved it with her children down there and just going down there to watch and socialize. And then also um, there is one of the softball players that has played there forever and also played with the volleyball and gone to celebrations in the pavilion and things. So um, there is a lot that takes, excuse me, a lot that takes part down there and that people enjoy. Then, I think it wasn't a part of this yet, but today I emailed you, um, let's see, Sarah, did they get the cost estimate that was requested or should I put that on the screen? Yeah, I, I sent it out, but um, late, just after you provided yeah. it. So yeah, I just got it this right afternoon. Um, would people want me to pull that up for what it, what? Um... I think that might be helpful. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop the share for a second so I can find it. <laughs> um, let's see. Field. Oh, let's. Okay. Scope summary. Here it is. Uh, nothing coming up yet. There we go. There we go. Okay, great. Okay, so I apologize that this didn't get to you earlier. Um, so this is the scope of the project it is now, um, Sarah now has it and, and you have it in your email. So um, this is showing you everything that would be a part of it. Um, I know you probably can't read as fast as I want to. Oh, let's see. Bring I, I it think down. most of us perhaps did have a chance to look at this, Anne Marie. It did come out. Okay. Before. Okay. There, there's um, what the cost um, estimates are. Um, conceptual plan and graphics. This is what the $150,000 would entail. That Great. is Thank all for you. my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Anne Marie. Just maybe if you keep that budget okay. up, please. Sure. Uh, perhaps folks have questions about that. Any questions for Anne Marie? 
I can actually also want to add just a couple of things. Sorry. Um, we Sure. will be working in, you know, obviously with the city DPW, with the city's park and rec, uh, park, park division. Um, I've already been working with Sarah um, on this with different ideas for the past few, you know, couple, well, since the, especially since the flooding last year, what kinds of um, ideas we have for this area, for this park, because it's so important to the community. So everybody would be working together with it and in collaboration for sure. So. Uh, Kevin. Uh, you're muted, Kevin. Thanks, Brian. Hi, Anne Marie. Hi, Kevin. Uh, the uh, the uh, two questions. One is, do you have a rough sense yet about how much you'll be able to prevent flooding and how much you'll have to mitigate the effects of flooding? I do not have a sense of that um, from what they've been doing up in Munson. And I think they also did a project in Long Meadow. Um, they seem to really be able to, you know, we'll be able to do the sort of uh, recreational activities we want, keep the field there and all those kinds of things, but build it so that um, it, it's going to be able to take on the water a little better. Like for instance, right now, one of the things we talked about was that the, a lot of people park park on the right hand uh, the um, right field side of the softball field and that's sort of where the river is coming right along the side there and so there there's so much that can be done with that area to help mitigate the flooding and and um that and and sort of lead it into other areas where it's more of a, a substantial um grassy area or some new trees and plantings and things so um that will be part of what they're assessing but i feel like a lot of what they've been doing is sort of the same thing as this and it's it's seems to be working really well so thanks and my second thing is more a comment than a question but um i think this would be a valuable source of learning uh, for the city that there's a lot of areas that are facing similar kinds of problems and um uh, what we learn here would probably ap be applicable in other places as well thank you Other questions for Anne Marie? Um, I have a question. Anne Marie, when you looked at some of the other projects that have been done to mitigate flood damage in parks, um, cost estimates, I'm sure, are widely vary depending on the project. But mm -hmm. do you have any sense of what, I mean, th this is a study, what, what cost would we be looking at, or do you have no idea? It all depends sure. on the consultants. No, that's, that's a good question. Um, so I actually looked at some of them because they do, if if you look at some of the projects they're working on, you know, it does, as you said, depend on what it entails. Some of them have dams near them or some of them have other kinds of hydraulic issues and things. Um, so it's been, you know, a few million that they've estimated and they've been doing them in pieces. So different towns, um, there is the, I think it's the state, Sarah can correct me or not, MVP, um, grants that they have um, been utilizing for those, which we're working through um, now with Sarah and planning with a group so that we will be eligible, the city will be eligible for those in the future, but she can talk more about that. Um, and then also we would look for some of the other state and federal grants to help fund this once we would figure out what can or can't we do with what they um, come up with with this study. So. But you just said uh, it, it's common to cost a few million for these mitigation projects. Um, I looked at one of their studies when I was just looking at the one up in um, one of the part of the months. I think it was the months in one. I can't. I'm not 100 percent sure. And, you know, part of it could was like an estimate of one to three million, depending on what they wanted to do. So, sure, when you're looking at, you know, um, the, the river and hydraulics and, um, you know, all those kinds of things, it's it's. It does, you know, with the engineering and site designs for that, it does um, drive some of the costs up. Um, but, well, you know, we'll see. I really, I don't have an estimate for, you know, depending on what it is we want to do there. Thank you. Chris, and what, and what they find, because DBW has been also trying to do some work with some of the culverts, like was mentioned earlier, too. So maybe they'll find something there that can be worked together and, co and work cohesively together to mitigate some of those problems. Uh, Chris Helm. Thanks, Brian. 
Um, thanks again, Amory. Um, crap, I, I just went totally blank. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I remember now. Um, so, uh, what about your timeline? What happens if we can't do this? Uh, and, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of Mainsfield. I, I, my involvement dates back to when I was four. So watching my dad play softball. So yeah. um, what if we can't do it this year? What happens if you have to push this back a year or, or so mm -hmm. as far as far as other things go? Right. I mean, I would assume that their costs would probably go up a little bit more to do a study. Right. But um, I would also just hope and, you know, let's hope that we don't have any big rain events again and things like that. I think we're trying to just get ahead of another kind of event that comes, um, which are becoming more frequent, obviously, um, and try to get something started. If if we could get this study done by June-ish of next year, a lot of the, uh, well, particularly the park grant, and there's a couple other grants that start coming out in um, in july and august to um, apply for so um i would hope that we would be able to be um on time to apply for some of those but i would say it would just kick the kick it down the road and we would we would still obviously want to try to do it and we would just hope that there wouldn't be any um you know big events coming thanks yeah and i used to watch my dad play softball down there too <laughs> And I'm sure they won all their games, both of you there. Yes. <laughs> there uh, other questions for Anne Marie? I'll ask one more, if I may. The, the last item on the uh, sort of um, the, the budget that you presented, Community Engagement Visioning Workshop, 64,500. That, that, doesn't that seem like a lot of money? And how, would, um, how would that? Yeah, I think it was so many hours and days that they were going to be doing it too. And then um, and then some of the supporting graphics, but this was an estimate. Um, they just tried to put together without, I mean, it's really not line itemed um, because, you know, it hasn't, it, it's it's not something that was picked apart. They, didn't, they said, we're not going to give it to you like so, so detailed. They sort of just made lump sums. Um, and I think, and sort of move that around. So I think that community engagement envisioning workshop is creating a lot of those, like those pictures we just saw for those other projects is coming up with a lot of those and envisioning, okay, what do we want here? And then taking those and placing them at Maine's field and coming up with all the concepts and all that. So I'm pretty sure that's what a lot of that is part of too, besides um, working with the public and having meetings and different kinds of things. In, so. in asking them to come up with these lump sums, was there additional fiscal information, detailed line item stuff that you could present to us from them? Or is this? No, this is this is it. This is it. Yep. Yeah. This is um, Fuss and O'Neill. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Anne-Marie? Okay, again, not to be redundant, but uh, November 5th is, <laughs> I'm sorry, November 6th, I got November yes. 5th on my mind. November 6th is the uh, citizens yes. input yes. stuff, so make sure you make that known to your folks. Okay. As always, well, thank, thank you, you all. very much, Anne Marie, yes. we appreciate it. Thank you, good to see everybody. Great. Thank you. Okay, next up. We have, uh, I believe it's uh, Michael Skillcorn. Michael, are you joined by anyone or is it, you're the man? Hi everybody, Elisa Klein is here as well. She Lisa. might jump in uh, if needed or if answering questions. So there's Elisa, great. Yeah. Um, so thank you both of you. Uh, Community Gardens Pavilion, Grove Food, Northampton. Do you have stuff for us to screen share? Are you talking? Yeah, let me give that a, let me give that a try. Good work here. All right, we up and running there. Looks good. Great, thank you. Um, great, so for those I don't know, my name is Michael Skillicorn, the Associate Director here at Grove Food Northampton. And we are 
hoping to build a pavilion, but I wanted to start um, kind of literally, I guess, zoomed out here on the piece of land that we're looking at to frame the overall vision for the project that we described. The pavilion is definitely the bulk of the funding um, that go towards this, but it's a part of a bigger project. Um, so this is in Florence off of Meadow Street. The recreation fields are across the street to the north. And this is a 17 acre parcel of our 121 acre farm. And this is actually the parcel of land that the city of Northampton holds a 198 year lease on. Um, and with an agreement with Grow Food Northampton that we maintain community gardens here and support small farming. So um, when I was writing the application, it really did dawn on me that the city and Grow Food Northampton have this partnership for public engagement and an investment in this piece of land already. Um, and I hope that our project that we're proposing here just continues to build on that. Um, so what happens on this piece of land is community gardening. You can see this patchwork here in the middle about 400 people come and garden here every year. Um, on both sides of it are small farms that are growing vegetables and flowers for the community. Um, and this piece of land is also the classroom that Grow Food Northampton uses for its education work. Um, just today, as a matter of fact, the fifth graders from Leeds came from a, for a field trip as a part of our K through five field trip program that's happening this year. So every single K through fifth grader at the Northampton Public Schools is coming to the farm um, and they really spread out. They go to four different stations and different parts of the farm and walk around and, and engage with the land and growing food in different ways. Um, and I guess another example of education on Saturday, we have a workshop for climate and flood focused hedgerow planting. So there's this spot, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but up here on the right on Meadow Street, there's a, a space that doesn't have any vegetation or trees. And this is where flood water comes across the street on our land. <laughs> so we're going to be doing a workshop and planting 150 different shrubs that will help mitigate some of the effects of flooding and catch debris and things like that. So those are just two immediate examples of some of the education that happens on this land and we hope to do more. Um, well, click ahead and kind of overlay different areas of the project, the overall project. On the left, the little square, the kind of center left is the pavilion that we'll talk more about. But um, this ribbon on the outside is a walking path that we started developing this year and hope to take to the next phase next year. And um, it will be a public access walking path around the edge of the farm and along the Mill River here on the right it's for people to be able to walk on their own um, with their dogs or in a guided way with Grow Food Northampton in some kind of education capacity. So it's a way for folks to engage, engage with the land and the river and also showcase some of the stewardship work that Grow Food Northampton is doing here, like the hedgerow planting, or you can see this kind of grid of, uh, this is a pawpaw tree orchard and perennial grain. It's a research project that's happening here about plantings that can happen in a riparian zone. Um, so maybe all that sounds like jargon, but there's a lot of exciting work happening here that we want the public to be able to engage with. And we're hoping to install benches and signage for these different projects. Zoom in a little more here. And the pavilion again is on the left. And then on the right is planting space that we're gonna reserve for education. So kids, for example, plant garlic in the fall or beans in the spring, and just to have flexible planting space for education of any kind. And then below it is the community orchard that we mentioned in our application. Um, and the hope there is to plant a diverse orchard of fruit trees and berry trees, berry bushes that can be available for pick your own with a walking path through the middle. Um, and that's basically used for education as well. So um, turn the focus now to the pavilion, but I did want to spend a little time on the overall land because that is kind of the heart and soul of what we're trying to do here. It's not about a structure, but the structure, this pavilion, um, this is sort of a base design for, will really be the starting place and the hub for a lot of the work that is going to be happening on the farm. And it is 
very essential to that work. Um, skip to the next one and have this kind of rendering of the structure. So currently there's no shade or shelter on the farm. Um, and that has been really limiting for us in terms of running programming because certainly on really rainy days, it's difficult to have program, but, it, but even on hot days and sunny days. So field trips have to be short, about an hour, an hour and a quarter, sort of the max. Um, workshops are kind of weather dependent and that kind of thing. So this pavilion will be a flexible space that can offer shade and shelter for people that are engaging with the land. And I'll just kind of run down a, a short list of examples of the kind of things that the pavilion will enable. So for the farmers on the land, it can offer processing space, um, somewhere for them to display their things or do CSA pickups or hold workshops for those that want to do some education of their own. For gardeners, it's a place for them to gather and just take a break, have lunch, um, and really a place for them to build community together. It's a place where people can come and hang out and don't have to spend money. It's just a place to be that's in nature and with each other. Um, and then definitely for the education programming, it'll be a game changer. Um, we'll be able to do longer field trips, half day programs, full day programs, things in the evening, um, potential camps somewhere down the line as well. Um, so I wanted to mention too that uh, we will be installing electricity or outlets and some, some lighting under the pavilion. We do have solar on another part of the farm um, that sort of can be transferred over to the use of electricity in the pavilion here. Um, and we'll use lights very occasionally for events in the evening and that kind of thing. Um, let's see, I think I have another view from the side. Uh, you can see these kind of panels. These are mock-ups of potential panels that can be added to the back. Um, that'll offer kind of a visual screen and, and make it a little more private. So that's something that's in the works. Um, and then I want to show you this too. There was a question from one of the committee members about detailed budget. And I think just today I was corresponding with our architect and I think we're putting the project out to bid literally tomorrow. Um, and the deadline that was set for responses is November 22nd. So I don't have you know, responses from contractors with detailed pricing for the construction of the pavilion itself. What I'm showing you here was a very preliminary estimate provided by a kind of a friendly builder who offered to take a look at the project for us and give a ballpark of what it would cost. So this is absolutely subject to change, but I wanted to just be transparent about the numbers that he provided. Um, it's possible that the bids might come in under and, um, Let's all cross our fingers for that. And I think that's all I had. I guess just sort of a brief summary that we feel like the space that we have offers a lot of public benefit as it is. And this project will really launch that to another level. Um, and our hope is that the farm and the pavilion can be a destination for people who just want to engage with the land around them, learn about it, learn from it, and agriculture and gardening and climate change in the river. And there's so much rich history of this land too. And all that is intersecting on this piece of land. So the more we can do to provide access to that, um, the better it will be for the community in our view. So I'll stop the share and open it up for questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Uh, questions for Michael or Elisa? I will, Michael, I've had a chance to corner you at the, at the site, but I'm going to ask the same question. It, it, it just, uh, I, I guess I shouldn't be amazed anymore at the cost of construction. Uh, having sat on this committee for a number of years, um, but I still, but I just can't help but look at that, look at the structure, which is sort of four posts and a roof, and some innovative um, stuff in in between, and see a cost estimate of one hundred ninety three thousand, and it's just, it, it's I find that shocking. Um, your comments on that? 
Yeah, I'm I'm with you. Um, you guys have probably seen a lot more cost estimates come across your way than I have um, from all of these various projects. Um, and I will say that when we started this thinking about this a couple of years ago, we were thinking about building a, a barn, a much larger structure. And we had in our heads very naively, oh, you know, maybe 500,000. And when we spoke to an architect, he said, ah, you should try more like 1.5 to 3 million for what you had in mind. And so it just immediately kind of brought us down to earth on what this stuff costs. Um, so that, and then the flooding that occurred last year really made us change what we're hoping to build here. So I guess one thing I can say too, is that it's, you know, it's not just the lumber of building the structure, but there's also site work and the, the patio or the stone that goes underneath it and installing electricity. And there's all of those different elements. Um, but I, uh, I hear you. <laughs> You, you're you're going out to bid. You said this this next week, and and how yeah. long do you anticipate it, it will take for bids to come back? Yeah, so I just read in the spec that the architect put out that there's a hard deadline of November twenty second. I'm not sure if bids will come in sooner than that. We're only sending it to three builders that we know of and are already aware of the project, so it could be sooner. Um, so. Yeah, but November twenty second as the as the last day. Thank you, Michael. Other questions for Grow Food folks? So, Michael, I think you perhaps heard November six is the public comment time, seven o'clock on Zoom here. So, encouraging. Uh, Grow food folks to come out if they are so inclined to make their feelings known at that meeting. Wonderful. Great. Nobody else. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Moving on, last but certainly Thanks, not Mike. is the mortgage subsidy program with Valley CDC. And let's see, Sarah is here. No, yep. who's, who's here for that? I'm Sarah Sargent. I'm the program Sarah. director for Valley and yes. Donna Cabana with the homeownership program manager is here as well with me. Good evening. I'm sorry, what is, what, what is their name? I'm sorry? Uh, you are Sarah and your uh, co-speaker um, is who? Donna Cabana is here with me as oh, well. Got it. Great, thank you. Yep. You good with me going ahead to share? Please. Okay. Let's see. Can you see my second? Um, so Valley Community Development, we have applied again for the mortgage loan subsidy program. Um, Donna Cabana, our homeownership program manager is the one who works um, with clients on a regular basis. The goal of the program is to provide four $50,000 loans to assist low and moderate income first time home buyers with down payments and closing costs when buying in Northampton. Um, the hope is that by providing these loans uh, to assist them that they are able to fill the gap um, in the current market that has been happening so that those who have lived here and work here can also try and stay here. Um, the program guidelines are that um, inspections of the property are required. Um, one has can't have more than uh, $75,000 of liquid cash assets. They have to be able to obtain a conforming mortgage with a 30 year fixed interest rate. Their household income um, is based off of 100% of the AMI, and that's gross income for a household. They must attend um, a first time home buyer workshop that is certified through CHAPA, state agency. Uh, the participating household must also attend a post purchase workshop. And the goal of, uh, for clients in participating in both of these is that they understand the homeowner process. 
um, from start to finish and that it's not just setting them up to purchase, but that they understand maintaining a home after they are an owner. Um, all properties must be free of chipping and peeling of paint prior to closing and lead paint inspections are required for any household with a child under the age of six. Um, it is a mortgage and note. So the mortgage subsidy will be in a form of a 1% simple interest at the time of closing with a 30 year term. This is a deferred payment loan that is due upon sale, transfer of the deed with interest of $500 a year for years one through 15. So um, after year 16, one through 15 will be forgiven each year of the principal of 50,000. At the end of the term, there's only 7,500 in interest due. The funds are also due when a cash out refinance takes place that does not improve the property. Um, the hope is that the people will be able to stay with the home for a period of time and that you know, um, depending on where they are in their life cycle, that they could also age in place. Um, I was thinking tonight while I was um, listening to others give their pre presentation as well and just thinking through our program more we provided an example of the household income for a family of four. And at 100% of the annual median income, a household family of four is roughly making $97,000. Their monthly income, and this is gross, so is $8,083. They could potentially afford a monthly loan payment and escrow of $2,500 and their purchase affordability based off of this is 300,000. That does not include that they will most likely need at least 3% down for some of the uh, mortgage subsidy programs that the state also offers like one mortgage. And it's expected to have two to 5% per closing cost. So $7,500. By providing the $50,000 um, loan subsidy, this brings their purchase affordability up to 350,000. And in some cases, what we are also finding um, in the last round that we provided the mortgage loan subsidy program, people in addition had some liquid cash assets that they relied on to also help fill that gap, though didn't exceed the 75,000. Um, so while they just based off their household income and a monthly loan payment, they're at 300,000, this subsidy just helps them be able to get just a little bit closer to where they might, um, to affording something that is, is uh, a decent place for them and move in ready. Um, does anybody have questions for us? I'll let Donna can also speak to the questions and working with clients specifically too. Good evening. I just want to add that, um, you know, many of the buyers did take advantage. Two of the buyers took advantage of a mass housing, the state finance agency program that allowed for up to $30,000 in down payment assistance and closing costs. So they were able to hang on to some of their funds for the immediate repairs that the properties needed, you know, which is, you know, really good for buyers because most buyers Honestly, they're broke after closing day. They've spent their last money on a moving truck and they don't have anything left over for the immediate repairs. The market's been pretty tight for first time buyers, very competitive. And these funds definitely help um, buyers looking to buy in Northampton to secure a property, folks who are below 100% of the area median income. I also just wanted to address one of the questions that Sarah had brought back to us about whether we thought that this subsidy was having an impact on the housing prices in our area. Um, in the last three, four years, four of these have been given out. Um, and so when we look at 27 homes were sold in Northampton area in August alone. So we don't see that these four are having a great enough impact on 27 on a monthly basis that are being sold. Um, we see it as 
that we're helping for that may not otherwise be able to be a part of that 27. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, uh, questions for Valley CDC? I'll start off with uh, uh, Kevin. I understand most of the criteria that you listed, but I didn't understand the chipping and peeling paint. That seems uh, the, the absence of uh, chipping and peeling paint would seem to imply a pretty perfectly conditioned purchase, which would be a more expensive one. I, I didn't understand that criterion. Well, um, households who have children under six should you know, should be looking at the mass lead paint law that states properties where children under six reside should be free of chipping and peeling paint. It's only around $300 to do the additional inspection for the lead paint. And we actually did um, have one buyer who inspected an older ranch home built in the 60s. And there was no there was no conditions of chipping or peeling paint in that property. And, you know, we really get housing stock and have it be lead safe for future generations. No, I understand the lead paint, but I thought you had that as a separate criteria. The lead paint inspection. Um, well, households who have kids under six, we're asking them to inspect for lead. Donna, we had the separate one where it's just if it's free of chipping and peeling, or is it a combined one? And we just happen to put the bullet to a separate yeah. It's a combined, it's a combined rule. Um, you know, we're really, really, we don't want to see the chipping and peeling paint, but if it's, you know, somebody who's able to mitigate this on their own and they don't have kids under six, you know, we would like them to do it. We don't want people to drive by this house and see it loaded with chipping and peeling paint on the exterior. We'd like to see that maintained and we want to know what the buyer's plan is to, to um, address that. But children under six, we really want to address it. Kevin, it's one in the same. I mean, it's one together. If we are, if it is being seen and you have a child under the six, then it is required that you get the inspection. If you have chipping and peeling paint, we're going to address it or at least bring it to your attention and have further conversation about it. But you don't have to do anything if you don't have a child under the age of six. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Kevin? Part, partially. It seems like you could have a lead paint inspection that says, no, you don't have any lead paint. You could still have some chipping and peeling paint. And uh, if you're willing to put in the sweat equity to fix that, you get a little better deal. So uh, yeah, that was the purpose of my question. Absolutely. Um, and in that post-purchase education class that we teach to new homeowners, you know, we talk about maintaining the home, which is an important piece of the education that Valley provides because it's great to get in the house, but then the long-term maintenance and managing that chipping and peeling paint annually is, is an important part of that. Other questions for Sarah and Donna? Um, Donna and Sarah, I know in the, the last mortgage subsidy program, you had a real challenge finding home buyers who were eligible and who also had the the equity and you know basically just walking that fine razor thin line of of income eligibility to be able to afford a, a home in Northampton. Do you see that continuing or getting worse or what what's your outlook on that situation? At the onset of the pandemic it was extremely difficult. We had so many out of town cash buyers coming into Northampton that dynamic has really slowed down. And the last two mortgage subsidies, you know, we did manage those much quicker than the, than the first two years because we literally started this program right at COVID. And um, the number of out-of-towners willing to bid, I, I heard numbers of up to 96,000 over the asking price because they wanted those properties. So that dynamic has really slowed down in the last four years. And the last two that we have given away in the in the last eight months or so, you know, the it the market has softened a little bit for buyers. There's not as many, we're not seeing 30 bids on each house like we were during the 
during the first year of the pandemic, you know, so, so some of that dynamic has slowed. Um, thank goodness, because it was really, really terrible, terrible for buyers at that point. Um, so, you know, we, we did have good success over this past year, and we really feel that the market is going to continue to soften up a little bit. And we're hopeful that rates will come down a little bit as well, along with incomes increasing. And we're, we're going to be able to um, work this program over the next two years. I think another piece is also people are more aware of this program now. Um, while they may not have qualified previously, they may qualify in the next year or so. Um, so people have also been taking educate, like working with us on budgets um, to understand what their affordability is or isn't. Um, they've also already taken first time home buyer classes. So people are just waiting at this point for like what, if there's the right property for them or what the right time is. So there's been a little bit, I think of like gearing up for this next round that it's um, people are more aware of the program and have uh, been educating themselves on the pieces that they'll need as they move through the home buying process. All four of the home buyers uh, who took advantage of this with, with previous funding are still in their homes and, and yes. doing yeah. well. Yes. Yeah. And I will say two of those households were below 80% AMI, which, you know, is a real challenge nowadays. In any in any city or town, all of them are in their homes, and also the um, three of them have provided their letter of support based off the impact that it had on them in our application that we provided. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Sarah and Donna? So you can invite them to participate in November uh, in our November sixth meeting if they so choose or uh, and any other folks that may want to speak to the success of your program. Uh, Thank you. Other questions? Good to go. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Donna. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So we have heard from four of our applicants. Uh, and two weeks from now on November the, I'm sorry, October the uh, 30th, is it? Day before Halloween, is that right? Um, we will hear from the other four of our applicants. And then the public comments being that first Wednesday in November. Uh, any committee members have any responses to any of these four applicants they want to share now? Or should we move to the next item? Good to go. Okay, so folks may recall two weeks ago we had Stuart Sagnor um, speak as to uh, the statewide community preservation coalition, why he thinks we should maintain our membership and pay the four thousand three hundred fifty dollars that he is requesting or the coalition is requesting of us. So. Uh, what we're going to try to do now is um, get through this with a, with a vote before there is a motion to approve or not to approve. Any questions or comments that folks want to share about that presentation that Stuart gave us? Sorry about the phone ringing in the background. Any comments? All right. Uh, Martha. Um, I think his presentation was good. Um, I, I guess I'm still struggling with the way they price these fees. Um, I know that they, he explained that they did have a tiered system. Um, but, you know, I, you know, for example, we have about a $2 million um, award budget. And we're paying the same amount as a city or town that has a four million dollar award budget, and I just, I just still don't think that's quite equitable. And I think I mentioned that um, at the presentation, but I just, 
and maybe they have um, restrictions placed on them by the state. I don't know how those fees were actually calculated, but it just, I still have some reservations about that. Um, not so much about the work that they do, but just how they structure those fees. Thanks, Martha. I wonder if, if we have suggestions or if he sends us at more of a, of a detail of how those fees are calculated, if we could make comments and get back to him about that. that would yeah, and Brian, we, we did do that once and we didn't really get a response to it. Like we were noticing that, like Martha just said, that the, the communities with the, you know, the smallest um, available funds for projects pay the same as communities that have you know, significantly more than that. And they, it's, you know, they could potentially look at ways to structure their dues year by year so that everybody pays an equitable amount or maybe have more uh, tiers than they do now. But I'm, I'm not quite sure how that works out. I mean, there, it's, it's not fully equitable. Like, um, you know, Boston had Boston and Worcester and Springfield are cities with a, a lot of um, local tax revenue that's generated. And, it, you know, every percentage that communities pay is, is different. So I think that's what Martha was trying to get at. Yeah, I think it's, um, it, you know, it, needs, it feels like it needs to be more of a percentage across the board. Um, yeah, and, and the other thing I just want to point out is he did mention that they're not really working with, um, working to get more communities into the pool like they have done for so long, I guess, since their inception. And so other than advocacy, I'm not sure um, where, where, where the labor is going, like what it, what, can, what it consists of other than advocating for the program at the state level. But other than that, I'm on board with it, with whatever anybody else, the others want to do. Thank you, Martha. Chris Helm. Thanks. Okay. Um, so in the past, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've uh, raised concerns about um, uh, the actual work that they did. Um, I, I'm, I'm unconvinced. I, I've been unconvinced, and I, I continue to be, that uh, the advocacy um, portion of it is as significant as as they make it out to be. I, I honestly believe that elected officials when confronted with a program um, that uh, brings cash into their communities are gonna be supportive of it. Um, the other part of it is, uh, and Martha touched on it, um, was the work that they did to bring other communities in into the program. To be candid with you, you know, as as one of the elected members of this committee, I actually think that that effort works against my constituency in that the pie of state money um, is what it is, and uh, by bringing more communities into it, uh, the, our slice gets gets progressively smaller. Um, but I think that that argument has sort of lost traction. Um, particularly since Boston entered entered uh, the program and gobble up the majority of of the state the state fund, um, so I'm less concerned about that than I used to be. But the but the the two things that that, that Stuart said that um, helped me get to where I am now, which is that I'm gonna I'm gonna support it, um, were were facets of their function that that I I wasn't either acknowledging or aware of. And one was um, what he referred to it as preventive ad advocacy, which is tracking and, and working to um, uh, block uh, efforts by various legislators to unfund or, or repeal the program. Um, that's something that, um, because my argument has been that, you know, it's the kind of advocacy that they were doing with regard to increasing the money is something that, that could happen at the state level through our legislators. But that type of work, um, that sort of opposition research stuff is is something that I think um, would would be is 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 done. I won't say necessarily better, but done done by them in a way that wouldn't necessarily occur. And I, I, I think that's an important component. 
And then the final thing was um, a piece of information that Stuart shared with us regarding, and it was anecdotal, but I think it was important, um, which addressed an issue, it was in response to a question Jeff Ray asked, uh, raised an issue that we've begun to struggle with, which is the relationship between CPC funds and, and municipal funding of, 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 of municipal structures. Um, and hearing from him the fact that not only is this a common practice, it's, you know, it's growing. And it, it's useful for us to know that. We, we, we came to that realization on our own, but it's good to know, um, at least for me, that this is a widespread practice um, because I think it's problematic for us. And I, I think it's good for us to know that it's a trend. Um, uh, and, and that's information that, that, you know, we as individuals or we as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a committee probably would not have encountered. So I think having an ear to the ground on a state level uh, that can provide us that kind of uh, intelligence is, ha has some merit to it. So um, that's where I am now. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Other comments about Stuart's presentation a couple of weeks ago? Kevin? Um, yes, I thought it was actually a reasonably compelling um, case that he made. Uh, the <laughs> What happens inside the State House is so chaotic and so demanding of everybody's attention all the time that, um, yes, it may be logically true that, of course, one would think uh, representatives of each location would be anxious to pursue something that brings money into their district. But when they barely have a, a minute to think through almost anything uh, without an advocacy group uh, uh, on their doorstep on some regular basis, I think the other uh, uh, priorities that do have advocacy groups uh, can become dominant. And, and so I think uh, I would prefer uh, strongly that this were the cost of this were on a percentage basis, as a couple of people have said, uh, but I think it's very much worthwhile for us to participate in. Thank you, Kevin. I think as a committee, if we feel that if we have a suggestion on how the coalition could better fund or better um, charge different affiliates such as ours in a more equitable way, we should certainly, uh, even if we've done it before and with little success, pass that on to Stuart uh, to devise some sort of uh, suggestion, suggestion for him. Any other comments on Stuart's presentation of a couple of weeks ago before we vote? Okay, so again, the uh, the dues requested of us for the, uh, I don't know what, what calendar year, fiscal year, I don't know how it works, is $4,350. Uh, Sarah, what, what what is that? Is it a calendar year? What is it based on? Do we know? Uh, I don't know. It used to be on a straight fiscal year, but then the uh, coalition switched up how they were doing the the billing. So I I don't I don't actually know. Okay, we will figure that out. Is there a motion about um, about the dues request for the Community Preservation Coalition? I'd move so approval. approval uh, Chris Tate, I think what you were you were starting. Yeah, I'd like to move to approve the dues. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. So the motion on the table is for four thousand three hundred fifty for this. We don't quite know whether it's calendar year or fiscal year to fully fund the request for the Community Preservation Coalition. Uh, is there any further discussion on this? If I can suggest an amendment to uh, the motion that uh, uh, if approved, that we'd be signaling to them that we're joining for a year and part of what we're going to be arguing for in the course of that year is a, a different uh, structure for the cost of membership, a, a more percentage-based uh, approach to membership cost. Okay, so we have a addendum to this dues request that we pass on that uh, concern or request along 
with our dues check to Stuart. Uh, so I think that can be part of the motion. Is that correct, Sarah? Sure. Yes. Okay. Any other comments or discussion on this motion? Uh, Julia. I know sometimes in the past we have paid less than requested for our dues. I recall at least one year when we were looking at this that we submitted, we agreed to submit an amount, but not the amount that was requested by um, by Stewart's group. And I'm wondering if that's something to consider or, I mean, I, I want to blackmail him into it and it almost sounds like it, but could we pay half of our dues and pay the second half contingent on understanding and learning a little bit more about the process for dues calculation and and uh, and consideration of equity in dues calculation? Because this seems like an inequitable process. Um, Julia, I believe that this came up two weeks ago and Stuart said it's an all or nothing thing. And that when we did that, they, uh, he brought it to his board. They said, no, you either pay in full or you don't at all. And that our partial payment was returned to us. Sarah has no recollection of that actually being returned to us. Um, Sarah's, yeah. Oh, okay. So here, here we're looking at, thank you, Sarah, for pulling this up. Yeah, and it, it essentially is an all or nothing proposition. Either you are a member of the Community Preservation Coalition or you are not. Um, I and I and I couldn't come up with whether the check was returned or not. I don't have a record that it was. I, I believe they kept it as a donation, but we weren't actually considered members of the, the coalition for that year. So we are at the the one million to two and a quarter million in local CPA revenue, um, pushing pretty close to this next dues structure, uh, which would be 7,900. We're, we're getting our money's worth. <clears throat> we're right under the threshold. Any comments on this? this dues calculation, uh, our, what we're voting on is saying that we're, we would be looking at encouraging him to amend this. I didn't realize that there were quite this many uh, categories. What is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, ten different memberships. Um, comments on this? Do we do we still, this, this makes things much clearer. Thank you, Sarah, for putting this forward. Any comments on this, Chris? No? No, I just didn't realize that, that our, um, Martha's, wave, Martha's waving her <laughs> hand. Uh, I didn't realize that we were in the million dollar, I, I thought CPA revenue was just our contribution. I didn't realize that, um, I mean, are we over a million dollars a year in Northampton generated revenue? Is that true? Yes. No. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I can I can pull. No, I believe you. I, I I believe you, Martha. Well, you know, so one thing he could do, we could suggest that he do, is to take a look at how much each community has to spend in CPA funds, and how much their dues are, and figure out what the percentage is for each community. <clears throat> And then average it. And then we find out, you know, what um, the average percentage is. And that, you know, then you apply that average to everybody. Presuming that it's going to be, you know, we won't be paying as much money if that's the case. I have no idea. Right. How many so we're at 1.8 million, million local revenue currently. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's an idea. Say it, uh, Martha, that went over my head. Can you say it one more time? Well, so yeah, he could take every community in CP who has CPA, um, for each community, take their local revenue and the amount of their dues. If you got what percentage of the local, local rent, you know, they're paying in dues. So if we're, you said ours is 1.8 million, 
Did you say 1.8? Yeah. Right? No. Yeah. Yes. And we're paying 4,000 in dues, whatever that percentage works out to be. Do that every for every community and then average the percentages. Add them all up and divide by the number of communities. And then you have an average percentage people are paying and just spread that across the board. I don't know. And, you know, it may make our fee go up. That's the only thing. I have no idea. <laughs> but. Well, Martha, doing that will make someone's fee go up. Right. There's that that ha and and part of the problem is we look at this table here of what the dues are, but we don't know what the distribution looks like. And I and I promise you that if we right. went to a mean based distribution, we're going to end up with somebody paying a whole lot more than they're currently paying. So okay. we will. I don't know. We'll yeah, those two hundred dollar fees. Right, the low one was two hundred dollars. I don't know how much yep. those towns have. Yeah, it's hard to say. Maybe that's not a good it, idea. It is because we don't see that. And, and what we'd really love for him to do is give us the distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a legitimate question that we could ask him. Mm -hmm. is give us that. Give us that distribution, which allows us to think creatively about how to perhaps come up with a more equitable formula. Uh, Sarah, is that something we would? You would feel comfortable asking him as we send this? Yeah, I mean, we we do. That's made public by the Department of Revenue, so we we could look at any particular community and see what their local revenue is in in any given year. Like, let's see, for example, like, uh, what's Boston like? Right, and we could put together a spreadsheet and we could come up with a distribution. But quite honestly, my gut says. He could pull it off a spreadsheet in five seconds. He wouldn't have to go community by community by community. Let's let him do it and tell us about it. At least he should have that. He should be able to do that. One would think. Yeah. Like, um, like Boston surcharge is twenty six million for comparison. Mm -hmm. Are they paying twenty thousand dollars? Yes. So that's like one percent. Is that what that is? Less than 1%. A little less than 1%, yeah. Yeah. And we are at about, let me see, if we're 1.8 million paying 4,000, what does that put us at? Two, Around 2%? Oh, so, so Boston's less than 0.1%, and we're at about 0.2%. Okay. Not 2%, not 0.2%. 0.2, yes. Thank you. So Sarah. if we were at 0.1%, You know, what would that be? Um... Okay, I'm gonna withdraw my motion. Withdraw your motion to approve. Okay. Um... So uh, just going on the other end for comparison like so so gosnold uh has the the smallest so they have they they raised uh just under just over what well, just over eleven thousand. so they are paying according to the due structure two hundred dollars what what so that's, so that's close to two percent so that's yeah. 10 times more than we pay Mm -hmm. on a percentage basis. Yeah. So that's... And 20 times more than Boston pays. Right. So, it's, yeah, it's not fair. They should get in for nothing. I'm, I'm muted. I'm not... No, 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 you're, you're not muted, Martha. But they could probably use more, more of the help also because they're new and they need more help. They're new, they're get small, up to speed. they do not have... They do not have a Sarah working for them, most likely. No, they probably don't, but a lot of communities don't. They had the committee just handles it themselves. I mean, they're, um, they, I mean, the amount of work that the community has to do if they only have eleven thousand dollars to work with is also a lot less than a, a larger mm -hmm. community with it with more mm -hmm. funds. What was this town called, Sarah? Uh, Gosnold. 
And where where is that? It's on the. Uh, it's it's always my favorite like small community to refer to. It's like a it's an island town. Yeah, it's um, like isn't it the Elizabeth Islands? Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. the west side of the west of Arthur's Vineyard yeah. into Buzzards Bay area. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, do we want to cordially decline membership and give them a donation of two thousand dollars and be on our way? Like, what are we doing here? I don't understand what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to tell them how to run their organization. Yeah, I mean, so the the uh, you know the invoice is is what they are requesting. So the the vote would be, you know, either to approve it or not, or to do something else. Okay, so let's go back to the drawing board here, Chris. You have you're the one that made the initial uh motion you have now withdrawn that motion is that correct, correct? that is okay. so correct so so is there someone else who would like to make a motion here i will make the motion uh, to pay the four thousand plus uh and uh, as i suggested in a friendly amendment before to signal to them that during our year of membership that we're agreeing to that we'll be advocating for greater clarity and uh, a more rational uh, pricing process. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second that. Oh. Okay, a couple of Jeff and Martha at the same time there. Any further discussion on this? So the motion is to approve $4,350 from Northampton to the Community Preservation Coalition with a stipulation that, or not a stipulation, but with an addendum that uh, in the next, during the course of the next year, we will be getting back to them when, with a request uh, for more equitable distribution based on some of the numbers that we get from them or come up with ourselves. Uh, any other discussion on this? Further discussion? Okay, Sarah? All right, so vote on that. Jeff? Yes. Chris Hellman? Yes. Chris Tate? Yes. Martha? Yes. Julia? Yes. Brian? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right, unanimous. All right. Stuart will be thrilled, or Stuart should be thrilled. Whether he will or not, we shall we shall see. So Sarah, you'll get that off and get language to him, reflecting what it is that we talked about tonight, and we will revisit this again at some point. Thank you, Sarah. Um, last but certainly not least, and this is something that uh, we do not have to vote on tonight, but let's see if if we are in the mood to. Uh, and that is to approve the 2024 community preservation uh, plan. Sarah sent that out. It came out uh, late. Um, sort of the the revisions uh, to that to that plan. Uh, is there? Did folks have a chance to uh, take a look at it? Do you want to? Do we feel inclined to vote on approval of that plan tonight? Do we need another couple of weeks to to read it one more time or digest it one more time what's the what's the thoughts here and and just to be clear there's no time pressure to approve this tonight if people want to think about it a little more and suggest some additional edits that's totally fine uh let's see thumbs up if you feel comfortable voting on it tonight anybody thumbs up uh one two three thumbs down if you would rather wait. Thumbs down. Uh, I think if we have three, I'm seeing at least with thumbs down waiting. If it's okay with you, Sarah, which seems to be, and there is no great rush on this. And since Sarah sent us this latest version a little late in the day, um, let's wait, let's hold off and have our vote in two weeks. Does that make sense to folks? Yes? All right, thumbs up on that. Um, great, so let's make sure we have a chance to take a look at that and get back to 
Sarah and or write down our, 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 our comments and we will vote on that after our meetings with the last of the four applicants for this round. Um, great. Any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? Yes, no? So let's remind our fellow public friends and family out there that November the 6th is the day to comment. If folks want to be comment, we're sending written comments on to Sarah that he can be reading as well. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. A second. I think Jeff had a second. I don't think we need to vote on that, right, Sarah? No. Yes. Good. Okay, we're good. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We will, oh, Thanks, oh, everyone. Before we go, uh, any news on our uh, newest potential member, um, Devin? Any news on your thing? No. Okay, so Devin is still an interested member of the public, waiting her, waiting from the for the mayor to figure things out. Great. It's and it's in the city council process. It takes a little bit. For, uh, for okay. the, the two readings and the subcommittee. And thank you for sticking with us, Devin. Yeah, thanks for letting me sneak in a couple of surreptitious comments early. Not bad. <laughs> we will see you in two weeks. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, thanks Sarah.